Good morning. I'm Shelley McLean from the Ottawa Hospital Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to the President's Breakfast for the Public Service Virtual Edition. Before we get started, I would like to remind all of our speakers to unmute your microphone before you begin speaking. And then I'd ask you to please mute your microphone when you're done. We are going to be hearing from senior scientist Dr. John Bell this morning. There will be an opportunity for you to ask Dr. Bell a few questions. Please feel free to type your questions into the questions and answer function. We may not get to all of your questions this morning, but we will certainly try our best to address them afterwards by email. Now, to begin our program, please welcome Annette Gibbons. Good morning and thank you, Shelley. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an, the Associate Deputy Minister at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. As you all know well by now, COVID-19 turned our world upside down in March. And as a result, we couldn't hold our annual in-person President's Breakfast for the Public Service in support of the Ottawa Hospital. Cette année, nous avons prévu un programme spécial pour souligner le dixième anniversaire de cet important petit déjeuner. Ce programme est maintenu pour ce matin, mais virtuellement. I hope you've grabbed a cup of coffee at home and you're ready for an inspiring program. So it's my pleasure now to introduce our first guest. I'd invite Ian Shugart, Clerk of the Privy Council, to unmute your microphone to say a few words. Ian. Thank you very much, Annette. And as you saw, I have my cup of coffee. I hope you do too. Merci à tous de vous joindre à nous cette façon virtuelle ce matin. Bien que je reconnaisse que nous sommes situés en toute sécurité les uns des autres aujourd'hui, comme d'habitude ces jours-ci, je crois que la plupart, sinon tous, sont dans la région capitale nationale. Et je tiens à commencer par reconnaître, euh, comme d'habitude, que la terre sur laquelle nous sommes euh, réunissant ce matin est le territoire traditionnel non cédé du peuple algonquin. Je suis très heureux de participer au petit déjeuner du président en appui à l'hôpital d'Ottawa et je tiens à souligner que l'événement d'aujourd'hui marque le dixième anniversaire du petit déjeuner. Il s'agit d'une collaboration extrêmement fructueuse. La générosité de la fonction publique accompagnée des efforts remarquables de l'équipe de l'hôpital d'Ottawa qui organise cet événement spécial année après année. Cette année, cette année extraordinaire, les choses sont un peu différentes en ces temps différents, pour dire le moins. Mais il est si important que nous continuerons cette tradition. Je tiens à remercier la Fondation de l'Hôpital d'Ottawa et les organisateurs pour leur effort visant à orienter cette approche novatrice pour nous réunir aujourd'hui. Fellow colleagues in the Federal Public Service, we have faced some challenging times over the last three months, and this is going to continue for a while to come, I suspect. But we're privileged every day <clears throat> to continue to work to help our country through this pandemic. We focused on work that we have to do for Canadians. And we've watched in admiration as organizations across the country and in our community have shown the same unwavering dedication, each in their own role, to helping Canadians weather this storm. As the largest employer in the National Capital Region, we've been grateful to have a world-class institution, the Ottawa Hospital, fighting the pandemic while continuing its high standard of research and care that we witness all the time over the last 10 years. I know that all of us today will make a commitment to build on the support that we as members of the public service 
have always provided the Ottawa Hospital. Our contribution is something each of us should be proud of, and I hope that generosity will continue today. I thank you in advance for your support for this tremendous hospital, which we're so grateful to have in our city. Je vous remercie d'avance pour votre soutien à cet hôpital exceptionnel qui nous sommes très reconnaissants d'avoir dans notre ville. Mes félicitations, mes remerciements euh, aux organisateurs et à vous tous. Merci. Thank you, Ian, and thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today. It really means a lot. Over the last three months, we've seen the key role the Ottawa Hospital plays in our community. It's a good reminder of how vital our support has been and will be in the future. This excellence is made possible in part thanks to your generosity. Permettez-moi d'accueillir ma co-présidente Margaret Moroni, vice-présidente de la Direction générale des programmes d'apprentissage à l'École de la fonction publique du Canada. Mark? Merci, Annette. Je suis ravie de vous voir si nombreux avec nous ce matin. I'd like to take a moment at this point to thank our committee and our volunteers for their tremendous support in bringing us all together for this program. And you will see their names on the screen. So thank you so much to all of you. Now, someone who has been with us since the inception of this breakfast is Dr. Jack Kitts. In fact, during his 19 years as leader of the region's largest medical center, he has seen the Ottawa Hospital through some of its most challenging times. It is Dr. Kitts who helped make the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute a reality, which has ultimately propelled us onto the global stage. And it is Dr. Kitts who instilled the belief that every patient treated at the Ottawa Hospital should be cared for like a family member. I'm so pleased to welcome the President and CEO of the Ottawa Hospital, Dr. Jack Kitts. Merci, Margaret, et bon matin à tous. Many of you know that I will retire from the Ottawa Hospital in a few days, and this is my last breakfast with you. Who could have imagined that our final breakfast together would be virtual? But then again, who ever heard of self-isolation, self-monitoring, and social distancing? We truly live in extraordinary times, and I'm very grateful that we could get together, at least in this way. I want to begin by thanking you. Thank you for your leadership and generosity in helping create a world-class hospital right here in our nation's capital. Words cannot describe how grateful I am for the unwavering support that our public service, all of you, have given the Ottawa Hospital over the past 10 years. $3.2 million is an incredible contribution to your hospital and your community. Your support has enabled us to accomplish so much, and we are celebrating some of these accomplishments this morning. Today, the Ottawa Hospital is home to some of the most brilliant minds in healthcare, and they've come to Ottawa from around the world. We have state-of-the-art equipment and technology, and our researchers are known for world-first discoveries in clinical trials. In a moment, you will meet, albeit virtually, one of our brilliant minds and researchers, Dr. John Bell, internationally recognized for world-first discoveries in cancer treatments. I also know that he's working on a vaccine with viruses for COVID-19, so he may be known for that as well. I don't know what he's saying this morning, but he may speak to that as well. As a world-class hospital, the citizens of Ottawa and the region, all of us can sleep well knowing that if we or a loved one are really, really sick, we will receive world-class care right here at home. But today we must look to the future and create a better tomorrow for healthcare in our community. We will do this with a new campus on Carling Avenue. This means better care with single patient rooms, private bathrooms, lots of natural light and green spaces. 
It will be fully digital, where health information is at the fingertips of both patients and caregivers when they need it. A new campus will propel research forward with more groundbreaking discoveries, and it will attract more of the brightest minds from around the world. To succeed, we will have to once again count on your support and generosity, much like we've seen in the last 10 years. We will need to come together for our biggest fundraising campaign ever. I believe we're on the precipice of a defining moment in time for Ottawa. And I know that this community will help turn our dream into a reality. And when future generations write this chapter, chapter in the history of our great city, they will see without a doubt that we understood the significance of this moment. Thank you all again for supporting your hospital and your community. Please enjoy the rest of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kitts. Let's give him a virtual round of applause. We wish you all the best in your retirement. In the past 10 years, we've heard from patients and family members who have shared their deeply personal health journey with us so we can truly understand the impact of our donations and the breadth of research being conducted at the Ottawa Hospital. And today we're going to share another profound story of care and recovery. I'd like to welcome Marcy Stevens. Please join me in welcoming her. She's a public service colleague from the Department of Public Safety. Marcy, thanks so much for being here. I'd invite you to unmute your microphone and please share your story with us. Thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, so Friday, January 11th, 2019 was supposed to be a normal day for most of the people in the city. It was a normal day, but not for me. Like most people, I was traveling home from work. Like most people, I was thinking about my loved ones. Like most people, I was planning my evening in my mind. Unlike most people, I never made it home. Within second, a normal evening became a tragic one, and I found myself pinned and helpless on a bus that was slammed into an awning at the Westboro Transit Station. Three people died there, and I was engulfed by panic and suffering. I remember being calm, but afraid. I did my best to help reassure the people around me. I called for help. I called my husband. I called my employer. I did my best to stay conscious and wait for the arrival of help. Help came in the form of paramedics, police, fire, rescue, who pulled me from the wreckage and rushed me, already missing one leg and bleeding terribly to the Ottawa hospital. I'm alive today because their trauma team was ready for me when I arrived. I'm alive because they acted quickly, wisely, and fearlessly. I remember being put into a CT scan, and it was then that my blood pressure began to fall critically low. But the trauma team were ready. A nurse by my side had O negative blood ready at hand, and she quickly got it into my system, keeping me alive. I was not the only person rushed to the Ottawa hospital that night. And I realized that in an emergency situation where many lives are at stake, every second matters. The team were prepared to act immediately and they made all the difference, not just for me, but for all the people who were brought in that night, suffering and who were returned alive to their family. The hospital accomplished something incredible in midst of something unpredictable. The last thing I remember that night is being rolled into the operating room for surgery. It was the last time that I would be fully awake for days. When I woke, my husband was beside me. He had to be the one to tell me that I had lost both of my legs above the knee. I believe that most people are very good at little changes to themselves, but it's impossible to be prepared for the changes that change you completely. I cried, I denied it, but I anchored myself to one simple thought. A life like this is better than no life at all. I realized that I wanted to see my children grow up far more than I wanted my legs. But of course, the hospital had a plan for, two, plan for that too. I began my rehabilitation almost immediately and while still in the trauma unit. In, the, in little over a month's time, I moved to the Ottawa Hospital Rehabilitation Center. This, pleasure, this place is a treasure hidden in our city. Like too many people, I didn't even know it existed. 
but it's a critical part of the system that people don't always think about until we suddenly depend on it. The health care team at the rehab took me in and taught me to live a life in a whole new way. They taught me how to overcome the obstacles of everyday life. They gave me skills that I would need to be the mother to my boys relied on. Some of these things I took for granted, getting out of bed, navigating my environment, using washrooms and kitchens that are rarely designed for people like me. The skills I need to do to do these things required me to change my own body. And the care team was up to that task too. They helped me exercise, taught me to eat well, and gave me the encouragement and confidence I needed to lose over 60 pounds to transform myself into something ready to succeed. It was three hard months in the care of the Ottawa hospital that I was finally able to go home, but their care still had not ended. I'm learning to walk again using prosthetics. I'm told that this isn't something that every above the knee double amputee is able to accomplish, but I'm determined and the hospital has and should continue to have the people, the tools and the training to get me there. While COVID-19 may have delayed my rehabilitation, it only made me want to push harder to walk again. Nobody is able to avoid going through what I have did, what I've did. What happened to me is not something I could have prevented by eating right and making good choices. We are all equally likely at some point to depend on the people, the equipment, and the hospital that saved my life. So the choice to have them be the best with the most rigorous training and with the most ad advanced equipment is a choice for ourselves and for everyone, every one of us to do what I did, defy tragedy and live. To the first responders, to the hospital staff, to the doctors, the surgeon and the nurses, to my care team, to the administrators and technicians, and the cooks and the cleaners and everyone else I never met but who is part of the team. You are part of something special to me. I'm grateful to you all. My family is grateful to you all. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Marcy, for that incredibly inspiring story. And you're absolutely right. No one wants to be there. No one knows when they're going to end up needing the care of the hospital. Nous savons que la recherche novatrice positionne l'hôpital d'Ottawa sur la scène mondiale. Our next guest knows all too well with his background in cancer research and how he's recently translated that to his investigation into COVID-19. Please welcome Dr. John Bell. And I'd ask you, Dr. John uh, Bell, to uh, please unmute your microphone. Great. Well, thanks very much for giving me the chance to speak to all of you today. Um, I might just take this moment to say goodbye to Jack. I probably won't see you in person uh, before the end of the week, but um, I don't know if people recognize the impact that, that Jack's had on, on us, not just in terms of running a great clinical hospital, but he's been a real champion of research as well. And, and that has paid off for us in Ottawa big time. So uh, this most recent thing with the COVID pandemic attacking all of us really, uh, how are we going to respond? Well, I think because of the support Jack's given the, the Research Institute, we were in actually a very good position to respond. Uh, I think there's over 50 projects now directed towards trying to find ways to mitigate the pandemic, uh, ways to treat people who are, are suffering from the, the side effects of, of the infection. Uh, ourselves, we're working on a vaccine, as was mentioned. And this really is because we were in a great position to do that because of the support we've had. Uh, a great team of, of people on the slide here, you can see this group of people who work with us on, on generating a vaccine, international superstars, people from all over the world who've come to work with us because the Ottawa Hospital has created a, a really a neighborhood here, a, a place where people want to come work and want to actually come and, and develop their ideas. So we were very fortunate. Uh, our work has been involved in, in, in generating what are called uh, oncolytic viruses or viruses which it can be engineered to attack cancer. And now we're being attacked by another kind of virus, a much more dangerous one that's really impacting all of our society. And, and we felt, you know, knowing what we knew about making viruses that attack cancer, could we take that knowledge, could we use it in a very positive way to create a vaccine? So working with my, my great colleague, uh, Caroline Ilko, who's another international superstar who originally from Argentina, who's now working here at the hospital, uh, we worked on, on making a vaccine and we're very excited about the progress we've made to date. 
Uh, we've received a lot of external funding from organizations who've recognized what we can do here and are supporting our, our, our projects to try to get a vaccine out as quickly as we possibly can. One of the reasons we're able to do that, uh, again, is, is, is I'm, and I'm really happy to have a chance to speak to all of you because you have supported us so much in the past. We have at our, uh, at our hospital manufacturing facilities. These are places, laboratories, specially designed to allow us to create therapeutics that can be actually used on patients. Uh, some of those manufacturing facilities are used by Duncan Stewart, for instance, to create cell products, uh, certain kinds of cells that he's now using in clinical studies to treat people who've been infected with COVID and, and help to uh, repair their damaged lungs. We've also been lucky because we've been able to have a, a facility that can manufacture viruses. And for viruses like COVID, where we're trying to actually generate a vaccine, we use uh, some of these benign viruses to create a vaccine. This couldn't really be done anywhere else in Canada. It's really actually only because we have this kind of manufacturing capacity here uh, that we're able to do this. And you know what? The reality is we only have this facility because all of you have continued to contribute to the, the hospital over many years and help support us. So we have infrastructure that other team, uh, other um, hospitals, other research institutes across the country do not have. So it's really allowed us to pivot very quickly. We've learned a lot from the vaccine we're creating. We're hoping to have it uh, manufactured soon and get it out into people as quickly as we possibly can. We're using that knowledge that we gained from the vaccine work though and putting it back into our work uh, in cancer therapy. So although there's been a short uh, hiatus in some of our cancer research, we've actually learned a lot in the, in the generation of this vaccine that we're now putting back into our cancer research. So I think it's really been an uh, a challenging time, as Jack mentioned, but really uh, an opportunity that we've been able to, to move on and, and, and respond to because of the great uh, infrastructure and support groups that we have here for research. So once again, Jack, thanks so much. Uh, we're going to miss you. And the truth is most people, uh, I shouldn't say this, most uh, CEOs of hospitals do not recognize the importance of research as you have, and it's actually made a huge difference to, to what's happening here in Ottawa. So thanks very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bell, for that. So we do have a few questions that have come in the question and answer function. And just a reminder that you can still ask some questions. Um, the first one is, if your team is spending so much time on COVID-19 vaccine, what is happening to your other cancer research? No, that's a great question. And, you know, uh, one of the things that we're the first in Canada with was, was the creation of a cancer therapy based upon immune cells uh, that we were very fortunate to get started here in, in, in Ottawa. Natasha Kekri was was leading that and we did have to pause that temporarily but actually only for a very brief time do we have to stop that trial and we're back at it again and that's actually going again and in both here in Ottawa and now in British Columbia so uh, we did have to have some pause uh, but as I said earlier you know some of the work we've done with vaccines has actually fed us brought us new knowledge that we're putting back into our cancer research anyhow so it's almost you know, interesting in a way, we, we've been able to build on what we've learned with the vaccines, and I don't think we're going to miss a beat. I think the cancer research is going to forge ahead uh, at full speed. Thank you. Um, so the next question is, what makes your approach to developing a vaccine unique? So how is it different from what other groups uh, working on vaccines that, are doing? That's a great question. And, and as you've read in the paper, there's a lot of vaccines out there being developed around the world. Uh, the truth of the matter is we don't know what's the best approach for creating a vaccine, what combination of pieces of the COVID virus should we use in a vaccine. It's just not known. So what we said is we, we, step, we step back, we said, what are other people doing? Uh, what's good about that? What could be improved about that? And, and that's what we've done. We've stepped back and, and made sort of a knowledge-based decision about how to create a vaccine. And ours are actually quite a bit different than other people. But we're very excited about them, though. Uh, we think that we're making vaccines that will be very effective in people who have cancer, for instance, in people who are elderly, where their immune systems are somewhat compromised. Our vaccines are designed to really super boost their immune responses. So it's a little bit different than the approach other people are taking, but I'm pretty excited about it. And um, the question uh, very specific about, about vaccine for, for COVID, is it more likely to be a flu-like vaccine that's administered seasonally or is it sort of a one-time thing that, uh, and you get occasional booster shots? That's a great question. And uh, the truth, uh, if I must tell you the truth, is we don't really know the answer just yet, but we're, we're designing for every possible uh, scenario. My guess is, from based on how we know how that virus grows, is it won't be like the flu. The flu is different every year because it mutates constantly. This virus has actually been very stable. 
So we think once we have a vaccine in place, it'll probably be good for the long term. You may have to come in for a booster shot uh, once or twice, but I don't think it's going to be a situation where you have to create a new vaccine every year and you're not sure how effective it's going to be. I think once a vaccine or vaccines have been identified, uh, then we'll be in good shape. First, the million dollar question. So when do you think your vaccine will be ready for testing in people? Yeah, it's it's more like the billion dollar question now. I get asked <laughs> so many times, but you know, it's not 100% clear because there's a lot of regulatory hurdles that we need to overcome, which are there and good for good reason, because the last thing we want to do is put out a vaccine that's going to make the situation worse, to be honest. Uh, we're working hard. Our, our goal right now is to have manufactured a virus that can be put into people by the end of this year. Uh, then there'll be a little more testing we have to do, but our, our dream is really to get this into people uh, sometime uh, in 2021, very early in the year, hopefully. Uh, but these things can, you know, there's a, there's some some uh, movement around that depend upon how our other studies go. But right now we're confident we can manufacture something at our facility here in Ottawa that be tested in people uh, probably early in 2021. Does, uh, does Canada have the manufacturing capacity to produce enough COVID-19 for, uh, for the entire population, to your knowledge? That's a great question, and, and and we have not got the capacity right now that we need. We're building towards that. Uh, it has been one thing that I think we could have done better uh, as a country, but then who would have predicted this? But I think we now have recognized that the need is here. That's why I think it's so critical that we have a manufacturing facility here in Ottawa. Uh, this is really something that, uh, as I said, there is no other virus manufacturing facility in the, in the country. Uh, we're certainly recognized on the world for being able to make these kinds of uh, uh, therapies for cancer and, and in vaccines. So that's something that was quite unique and, and it's really only happened because of the support we've received from the people in Ottawa, which have allowed us to, to really create something quite special. But I think, you know, we could probably make uh, somewhere around uh, a million doses uh, over, uh, you know, a couple of months period. But obviously we need more than that. So I think there's going to be a need to have more manufacturing capacity and that is already beginning to happen. There's new new GMP facilities being made in Montreal, for instance, and other places around the country. So I think we'll respond by the time there's a vaccine ready to be manufactured, we'll have the capacity. What do you find most challenging about the virus in, in, in terms of, uh, of of finding a vaccine? Like what, what are what are some of the challenges that you're facing? Uh, you know, that's a, a, another great question. I think the fact of the matter is uh, this is a new virus in some respects. It's not one which we prepared vaccines for before. So we do have to use uh, our knowledge, our understanding of how to make vaccines and make some some good predictions about what might work. Uh, but I think we do really need to, to have as many people working on it as we do now, not only in Ottawa, but around the world, because it's probably going to be a combination of vaccines that's going to be the best approach. Uh, the good news is this virus is not like a virus like HIV or the AIDS virus. That's a really tough virus to make a vaccine to because it's constantly mutating. This virus has had some mutations in it, but not really a lot. And so it's much more stable. And so we people believe, I believe, that we'll be able to get vaccines uh, or combinations of vaccines that'll work because this virus is not highly mutating. So, so that's the good thing. But in overall, it, you, you have to sort of make some uh, predictions about what's the best approach and then you have to just have to do the experiment and find out. So um, the, this is going to be the last question um, and, and it's a more general question about you and your career and that is why did you come to do research at the Ottawa Hospital and why do you continue to stay there? Uh, well, I, the last part I can answer easiest. My wife says we're not going anywhere else, so so we're staying here no matter what. But the, the reality is, you know, I started my career in, in Montreal. Uh, well, first of all, I was training in London in England for a while. I came to Montreal, had my first lab there at McGill, which was a great university. Uh, and uh, certainly at the time, especially that department I was in was, was recognized here nationally as one of the best in the world. But uh, there was an opportunity to move to Ottawa for a number of reasons. One is I thought the health care would be better for our kids here. We actually live right behind Chio and I had three boys. I knew they were constantly going kind to of have to go get stitches. So that was part of the decision to be close to that. Uh, but I think also, uh, you know, the, the Ottawa Hospital and the uh, University of Ottawa su suggested to me at the time that they wanted to move towards having a, a situation where you could develop a research program 
that wasn't just to cure mice, but to cure people. And to do that, they were going to provide the infrastructure we needed. This new cancer center we have, which is tremendous. And as I mentioned, these manufacturing facilities, both for cell products and virus products, these are quite unique across the country. And so it was very attractive for me to, to come here and move my research program here because I thought this is going to give me the opportunity to really do something important and special. So uh, I think, again, it was the people of Ottawa who supported that initiative and, and are very, very appreciative of that. Thank you so much, Dr. Bell. It was great to hear from you on those things. I also have three boys and I also live close to Chio, which turned out to be a very, a very good thing. Exactly. Um, so if we didn't get to your question, the foundation is going to try to uh, answer them and respond by email to folks in the coming days. So thank you all for your participation. That was a great interactive uh, part of this event. So now I'd like to hand things back to Margaret. So thank you, Annette, and thank you so much, Dr. Bell. Incredible to hear about the innovative research happening right here in Ottawa. So as this is Dr. Kitt's final breakfast with us, I'm asking you to help his vision become a reality and pave the way for a new 21st century healthcare centre. We are here today to ask each of you to make a financial commitment to the Ottawa Hospital, an investment in the care of someone you love. We know that the reality is, at some point, each one of us is likely to need the care of the Ottawa Hospital. We ask you to consider making a min meaningful gift today and invite you to consider joining the President's Council of the Ottawa Hospital, which means a donation of $1,000 or more per year. Our ultimate hope is that you would consider making that an ongoing commitment for five years. Perhaps, as we celebrate this milestone year, you would consider a special gift of $1,100 by adding 10% for our 10th year. En tant que membre de la fonction publique, le premier et plus grand employeur de la région, nous sommes très fiers du travail que nous accomplissons pour notre pays. Nous avons la responsabilité de faire preuve de leadership et d'investir dans l'hôpital d'Ottawa, ce centre de santé et de recherche exceptionnel et dans notre collectivité. Ensemble, nous créons un système de santé fiable pour l'avenir. To make your donation, you can access the donation link in the calendar invite you received for this event. You'll also see the link in the chat column. You can make a one-time contribution or you can conveniently set up a monthly or annual donation. You can also select your table host's name to honor their volunteer efforts this year. And if you'd like to speak to someone or would prefer a pledge form to complete your donation, the foundation is very happy to reach out and you'll find that contact information on the slide. So that brings today's event to a conclusion. I would love to share some great news. So far, we're tracking it close to $80,000 in. So thank you for the generosity that's already been extended. And this brings today's event to a conclusion. Merci encore. Thank you for joining us virtually for your support, leadership, and generosity. Have a wonderful day. Et merci. Bonne journée.